The ancient Greek aphorism, no se te ipsum, calls on us to know ourselves. In this video we will be looking at sociological explanations of self as it relates to the world, how we define ourselves, the emotional affect we attach to contingent domains of self-worth, and the strategies we employ for maintaining a positive self-image. First things first, what do we mean by self? The answer should be obvious, but it's not. The self is not solely the objective image we see during self-reflection. The self is that which does the reflecting and the reflection it produces. In other words, we construct our own objective self-image. The we that does this, however, is an evolving process. In this video, we will be looking at the work of several researchers and the theories they've produced to explain us to ourselves. This is by no means an exhaustive account. There is much more to be said about these works, let alone those that will not be covered or other approaches to the question besides sociology, such as philosophy and theology. Many of the quotations and data are taken from Handbook of Self and Identity by Mark R. Leary and June Price Tangney, a sociological reference book described by Gifford Weary as an impressive overview of second-generation research on the social and psychological processes involved in the human capacity for self-awareness, self-representation, and self-regulation. This well-organized volume is remarkable for its breadth of coverage, the expertise of its contributors, and the quality of its chapters. It is an indispensable reference work for anyone interested in the self. As said before, the self that we are here interested in is the self we find in reflection, the individual at the core of our inner experience, that which feels pain, love, fear, and lust, the self that feels discomforted in uncertainty and proud when we have sure recognition of our efforts, the self that has ensured a pleasant abode in the back of our minds, if only circumstances would promise to permit and not drive us into distress and despair. For this reason, sociologists tell us we focus almost exclusively on maintaining a positive self-image, and we accomplish this with strategies for self-presentation. Self-presentation is distinguished from other behaviors because of the importance of influencing the communication of information about the self. Children as young as six years of age are able to identify the interpersonal functions of self-presentations. They can indicate that ingratiating actions are designed to obtain approval, and appreciate that such actions are not just descriptions of private feelings and psychological states. Children as young as six years of age are able to identify the interpersonal functions of self-presentations. They can indicate that ingratiating actions are designed to obtain approval, and appreciate that such actions are not just descriptions of private feelings and psychological states. Sociologists distinguish between two modes of self-presentational behavior, largely unconscious scripts that are triggered by threats to the image of oneself. Automatic behavior is generally carried out in environments one identifies strongly with, such as at home or in a familiar workplace. In the mind of an actor in automatic mode, there is no self-conscious attempt to control the impression made on others, yet the goal-directed activity of constructing and protecting a desired identity takes place. If events threaten the identity that actors want to portray, the discrepancy between the events and their script triggers the alarm, and actors focus their attention on image repair. When these predicament-creating events occur, people engage in remedial activities designed to protect their identities. These activities fall into three broad categories, accountability avoidance strategies, accounting strategies, and apology strategies. Accountability avoidance strategies. These strategies are designed to put off, avoid, or escape from tasks, situations, and audiences that threaten desired identities. Avoid tasks that produce embarrassment, even sacrifice money to do so. Avoid social situations they expect will produce anxiety and prematurely leave those that elicit anxiety. Conceal embarrassing or out-of-character information. Information about themselves they do reveal is usually uncontroversial and undiagnostic. They try to terminate self-criticism. Can escape from aversive self-evaluation by turning to alcohol, drugs, physical exercise, meditation, television, shopping, and other activities that reduce self-consciousness. 
They escape accountability by denying the evaluators legitimacy as judges. People may assert, you have no right to judge me, and refuse an explanation. Accounting strategies. When facing predicaments, people construct accounts that provide self-serving explanations. These accounts attempt to reconcile the event with the prescriptions for conduct that appear to have been violated. Defenses of innocence, which assert that a violation did not occur or that the actor was in no way involved with the violation. Excuses, which claim that the individual was not as responsible for the event as it might otherwise appear. Justifications, which claim that the event was not as negative as it might otherwise appear to be or was actually positive because the actor was working toward a valued, superordinate goal. Apology strategies. Apologies can be split into two groups. Genuine apologies in which an individual genuinely feels remorse and is unlikely to repeat the behavior intentionally but may continue out of habit and apologies based in self-presentational concerns in which apologies are made to save face. Another way to improve one's self-image is to improve the self-image of others by bolstering the identity of others through flattering behaviors, agreeing with their opinions, imitating their behaviors, or doing favors for them. People will assist helping others only to attribute others' successes to the help given. When negative information is made public, people switch to evaluating the self on different domains. Sociologists also find that a preoccupation with self-presentational concerns has negative health consequences, including HIV infection, skin cancer, eating disorders, alcohol and drug abuse, and accidental death. Countless consequences of being absorbed in self-presentational concerns can be seen in the way individuals high in self-presentational concern respond to adverse external circumstances and adverse internal self-objectification, seeing oneself as an object instead of an evolving process. Public self-consciousness, for example, is positively related to social anxiety, shyness, and fear of negative evaluation, and produces conformity designed to please immediate audiences. Let's look at how the self is defined according to domains of contingent self-worth. When we think of how we relate to our parents, siblings, friends, and co-workers, these are all different domains of contingent self-worth. They are areas in our lives within which we identify ourselves and derive pleasure and pain according to how we perceive ourselves in each domain. When we tend to perceive ourselves as being bad, in a domain, we have a tendency to abandon that domain and ground our self-worth in another domain we think we will have greater success in. We turn now to the idea of introjection, drawing from Richard M. Ryan and Kirk Warren Brown's Why We Don't Need Self-Esteem on Fundamental Needs, Contingent Love, and Mindfulness. Self-esteem would appear to be a laudable quality. Indeed, from a superficial view, what could be wrong with esteeming the self? Esteeming oneself would seem akin to the other prescriptions of modern social cognitive psychology. Be optimistic, hold positive illusions, accept success, feel efficacious, be happy. But like many of these positive prescriptions, the admonition to esteem oneself is more complex and problematic than it seems. Previous SDT formulations of contingent and non-contingent self-esteem and our recent findings concerning mindfulness we suggest that when self-esteeming processes are salient, there is something awry with self-regulation and with well-being. Based on SDT, we argue that although self-evaluation is a natural human tendency with both evolutionary and developmental foundations, ongoing concern with the worth of the self is a byproduct of need deprivation or conflict. Specifically, the salience of processes in which the self is esteemed or disparaged is ideologically linked with the experience of contingent regard by significant others. We hypothesize that contingent regard increases one's proneness to interjection, a form of behavioral regulation in which one's actions are motivated by desires to gain or not lose self or other approval. Interjection, in turn, leaves one vulnerable to exogenous social pressures, the pursuit of unfulfilling goals, and the inauthentic living that can follow from them. Based on Buddhist perspectives, we further suggest that regulation based on mindfulness rather than on contingent self-regard is associated with healthier and more vital living and provides a basis for acting more authentically. Interjection represents the internalization of the contingent regard of significant others. 
If a mother, for example, showers loving praise on her daughter following a success, yet shuns or disparages her following failure, then she sets the stage for her child to subsequently treat herself as she has been treated. The daughter is likely to develop the intrapsychic tendency to shun or love her own self contingently. SDT further suggests that a child will be particularly prone to interjection the more he or she desires relatedness to the parent. Thus parents who are merely hostile or neglectful will typically fail to inspire any inter internalization including interjection because they have supplied no motivational basis for the adoption of the standards or values they hold. Indeed, it is often the most invested parents who, if they are also psychologically controlling, engender the strongest forms of interjection. As said before, this presentation is by far not complete and will need some serious work to cover all of the self. Perhaps I'll produce an expanded work of a link to additional and source information in the description for your consumption and consideration. Before I end this brief introduction, I would like to draw attention to one more way of thinking about the self, the sociological brainchild of Irving Goffman, presentation of self in everyday life. When an individual appears in the presence of others, there will usually be some reason for him to mobilize his activity so that it will convey an impression to others which it is in his interest to convey. The following description and bulleted points are taken from the Wikipedia article on dramaturgy. Dramaturgy is a sociological perspective stemming from symbolic interactionism and commonly used in micro-sociological accounts of social interaction in everyday life. The term was first adapted into sociology from the theater by Irvin Goffman, who developed most of the related terminology and ideas in his 1959 book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. Kenneth Burke, whom Goffman would later acknowledge as an influence, had earlier presented his notions of dramatism in 1945, which, in turn, derives from Shakespeare. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. There are seven important elements Goffman identifies with respect to the performance. Belief in the part one is playing is important. Even if it cannot be judged by others, the audience can only try to guess whether the performer is sincere or cynical. The front, or the mask, is a standardized, generalizable, and transferable technique for the performer to control the manner in which the audience perceives him or her. Dramatic realization is a portrayal of aspects of the performer that he or she wants the audience to know. When the performer wants to stress something, he or she will carry on the dramatic realization. Idealization. A performance often presents an idealized view of the situation to avoid confusion and strengthen other elements. Audiences often have an idea of what a given situation should look like and performers will try to carry out the performance according to that idea. Maintenance of expressive control refers to the need to stay in character. The performer has to make sure that he or she sends out the correct signals and quiets the occasional compulsion to convey misleading ones that might detract from the performance. Misrepresentation refers to the danger of conveying the wrong message. The audience tends to think of a performance as genuine or false, and performers generally wish to avoid having an audience disbelieve them. Deception refers to the concealment of certain information from the audience whether to increase the audience's interest in the user or to avoid divulging information which could be damaging to the performer. That's all I have for you for now. Uh, in the future I may have something more for you, but as Doris Day saying, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be.